Come on, church, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. Amen. Welcome. Welcome again to Discovery Church. You are here at the start of a brand new series, changing gears a little bit. I mean, we did the spiritual warfare thing. Now we're talking about the blessed life. Uh, if you're kind of new to Discovery, I like to mix it up, man. I like to give you a balanced diet of the Word of God. We don't just stay on one section of the Bible. We're not going to stay on one genre. I want to teach you and disciple you and mentor you and pastor you throughout the entire Word of God, not just in certain aspects. And this is going to be a huge one, a huge one, because we all want to live a blessed life. How many want to be blessed by God up in this place? You don't want God's blessing. We all do. We all want it. But, but I mean, what if it's not what you think it is? What if like what you're creating even unintentionally in your mind about, about what it means to be blessed? Or even when people ask you, how you doing? What's your response? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Oh, I'm blessed. What does it mean? What does that mean to be blessed? Is it, is, it, is it more than just money and financial and the house or a car? Is it, what are we saying when, when we're talking about this blessed life? And I want to teach you that. Like, according to the Word of God, how do we live a blessed life? Let me do this first, though. I want to kind of expose, like, different types of blessings. When you think of blessing, you probably think of one of these different five types of blessing. There's probably more, but I got five of them for you that, that when we think of being blessed or we want to be blessed, it's probably in one of these five different categories. And I'm not even going to try to teach all five of these. I'm just going to, I'm actually a specialist in only one of these. So I'm going to just teach the one. But, but let me show you just so you can write it down and see it. Like, we, like what's, what's the blessed life that we're actually thinking about? Because you think about being blessed. Some of you think about being financially blessed. Write that down. Being financially blessed. That has to do with your money. In fact, probably most of us, I would say, when we think of being blessed, we equate that to dollars or cents. So a lot of people chase after wealth and work endless hours and they'll sacrifice their health and their relationships and their rest for financial blessing. The second type of blessed, maybe you think of socially blessed. To be socially blessed, like like your status. And, and like I said, I, I'm not a... I'm not going to teach this. Go read How to Win Friends and Influence People, okay? Something like that. To, but, that's, but this is where some of us, we pursue status by curating our lives on social media, seeking approval. The reality is, listen, all of us want to be liked. Every one of us wants to be liked. Every one of us wants approval. It's inherent within, any, within all of us. So there is a social blessing. The third is time blessed, and that's called your freedom. Some of you feel like you're in prison from nine to five. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Like, you're like, like, I feel, I just need to get free. I can't wait till I'm free. And you wait, like the weekend is when you're free. You're finally free. But there's this idea of, we have, some people are blessed with time. Oh, I wish I had just more time, more freedom if I had that blessing in my life. How about this one? Physically blessed. To be blessed in our health, where some of us were like, Different, we're on different diets and fads and routines and fitness cycles and self-care. And, and we, want, we want to be healthy. We want to be physically blessed. Yeah, I mean, these are all types of blessing. But really, the most important and what I want to teach you, the, the, what I believe is to be truly blessed is the eternal blessing. That is to be blessed spiritually. The world tries to offer temporary satisfaction through achievements and possessions, but your eternal blessing is secured when we live with heaven in mind, walking in faith and storing up treasures in heaven, not on earth. Now I want you to be careful here and look at all these five because you gotta be careful not to chase after the first two at the expense of the last three. See, the enemy will lure you into thinking that chasing the first two is enough. That if you had money and status, that you would be happy. But I'm telling you, do not sacrifice the last three on the altar for the first two. Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So I want, I want to teach you, in this series, I'm going to teach you the kingdom principles of a blessed life. So instead of pursuing wealth or status or health, if you pursued God's kingdom and his righteousness, I promise you those things will be added to you. 
So let me just, I want to teach you the, the kingdom bless life. Je Jesus said it like this in Acts chapter 20, 35. Jesus said, it's more blessed. Okay, because there's a blessing in those. Don't get me wrong. There is a blessing in that. But there's also a measure of blessing, and it comes with certain costs and consequences. But it's more blessed, Jesus says, to what? To give than to receive. Now, here's the kingdom paradox that some of us need to recondition our minds as children of God. You think of blessing as to what you are receiving, not to what you're giving. And until you recondition your mind, you will never truly live the blessed life. You won't, you won't. Where we're thinking, well, what do I have? What can I get? What can I get? This, and this goes against everything the world teaches us, doesn't it? The world says, get as much as you can. And Jesus says, give as much as you can. Why? Because the key, write this down somewhere, to the blessed life is a heart of generosity. When we live with open hands, God fills them with more than we can imagine. This, this is the, a key principle of you living this blessed life that we have to understand the blessing of giving in order to receive. Generosity isn't just about money. Please understand this. It's, 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 I'm not talking about money today. Giving, whenever you hear giving in the context of church, you think money. It's about living a life that pours out, that gives time, that gives encouragement, that gives love, that gives forgiveness, all of it. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 reminds us of this truth. He says, one man gives freely, yet gains even more. This is the kingdom principle we're talking about. One man opens his hand and gives, yet gains even more. Another withholds, clothes his hands unduly, yet comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will reap back unto himself refreshing. The more you give, the more you live. The world says you gain not by keeping, but by giving. The blessed life is determined, listen to me, by what you are sowing and what you are giving. Here's how Jesus said it in a very popular passage that is used oftentimes in when it comes to like giving and finances, but it's actually not the right context. It can be applied there, but it's not the right, not the right context. Let me show it to you. Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Do you see what's happening here? What's being released is what's being received. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, and shaken together and running over will be poured out into your lap. For the, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, can I ask you a question? Anywhere within those verses, does it talk about money? No, this is not a money verse. We often hear this scripture when it comes to finances, but look at the context. It's about judgment, condemnation, and forgiveness. Jesus is teaching us this principle. You reap what you sow. If you're sowing judgment, guess what? you're gonna get it back. If you're sowing condemnation, it's coming back, pressed down, shaken together and running over. But if you sow forgiveness, mercy, love, it's coming back to you. What you sow, you grow. What you sow, you grow. So it would be better, <laughs> Jesus is saying, to sow good seed. The truth is, whatever you give, whether it's money, it's time, it's even in your attitude toward other people, it comes back to you and not just in a little bit, it comes back to you pressed down, shaken together and running over. This is the law of sowing and reaping. And if you want to learn how to live the blessed life, we have to understand this biblical concept, this kingdom principle. You may have heard that before, but I want to teach it to you today that you would catch it and live differently and access this blessed life because it's available to you. It's just not the way the world is telling you. Proverbs eleven eighteen 18 says it like this, the wicked man earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness will be certain, meaning you can guarantee this. This is a universal law established by God. He will reap a reward. 
I want you to understand this principle applies, please, not just to your money. We're going to look at it today. I'm calling it the seven laws of harvest. You, if you apply this to your relationship, to your time, to your words, in your talents, and the way you use your energy in every area of your life, these seven laws of sowing and reaping, of harvest from the word of God, seven laws. How many of you want to see a harvest of your energy? How many of you want to see a harvest of peace in your life? You want to harvest some peace in your life? How many of you want to harvest love and acceptance and grace? Anyone want to harvest some grace in your life? Anyone want to harvest some money, some resources, and all of it, all of it? How do you do it? It's through God's word. That's how. You got to understand this principle of the law of sowing and reaping. Okay, seven laws of harvest, I'm calling it. Here they are. Number one, the first principle is this. Everything starts as a seed. We have to reckon everything starts as a seed. Every idea is a seed. Every dream is a seed. Every achievement is a seed. Every building that is built was first a seed thought, a seed idea. Your life began as a seed. Everything starts as a seed on this planet that God made. This is how he established it. God created the world around what he calls the seed principle. In the very first chapter in the Bible, God calls this to our attention. Genesis chapter 1 verse 11. God says, let the, let the land have seed-bearing plants and trees that bear fruit with seed in it according to their varieties. You've heard the saying, anybody can count the seeds in an apple, but only God knows the number of apples in a seed. Okay, because a seed has exponential potential. You take one seed, you plant it in the ground, and it grows a giant tree which produces much fruit, and, and each fruit is more seed, and you leave that over like thousands of years, an entire forest and thousands of acres from one single seed. The Bible says in the book of Zephaniah, do not despise the day of small beginnings because everything starts small. Everything in life, everything in life begins as a seed. Discovery 11 years ago started with a seed. Just an idea. It was a seed idea. It was a seed of three families. It was just, it was just a seed. That's all it was. A seed. Everything in life. That's what happened. Everything starts as a seed. That's the first principle you need to recognize. The second principle is this. Number two, nothing happens until that seed is planted. Nothing happens in your life until the seed is planted. Many years ago, I bought some seeds from Lowe's to, to you know, have some fruit trees in our backyard. You know what? Those trees never produce fruit. They never did, never produced. I couldn't figure out why until later I was going through my garage and I found the seed still in the packet. Of course it didn't produce. I need, I didn't, I forgot, I didn't plant the seeds. Of course it didn't produce. A seed that's in a box on a shelf is worthless. Seeds are meant to be planted. Imagine a farmer going out, spending his life savings on on some seed, and he puts his, all this seed, and he's got it in his barn, and he gets ready to, to, to start springtime, and he's looking out at this barren field, and he's bought all this seed, and all of a sudden he goes, I don't know if I should plant this seed or not. I got all my life savings stored up in this seed. I don't know if I should, if I should, you know, get, I'm too afraid to plant the seed. All of it is in the barn. I don't think, I, I think I'm gonna hold on to, I don't think I wanna plant, I'm gonna play it safe. I'm not gonna plant my seed. We would call that farmer an idiot, a fool, because seed is worthless unless it's planted. You got to put it in the ground. Now, some of you, listen, some of you think you're waiting on God. You think you're waiting on God for that job. You think you're waiting on God for that husband. You think you're waiting on God for your big break or big deal. You think you're waiting on God for the income to come in. And God says, you think you're waiting on me? What? I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to plant the seed. You're not giving me anything to work with. This is a, this is a law, a principle. God says, you got nothing to work with. I'm waiting on you to plant that seed. It's not going to happen until you plant some seed. Everything in your life starts as a seed. A relationship, a marriage, a business, a church, everything starts as a seed. And nothing happens until that seed is planted. Now, why is God doing this? Why does God establish this? Because planting is an act of faith. 
It's an act of faith. I take what I've got and I give it away. I, I, I put it in the ground, I bury it, and God says planting is an act of faith that brings glory to God. Jesus explained this principle when he was trying to explain why he came to earth to die on the cross. He used this principle of sowing and reaping. John 12, 24. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, it cannot produce. But if it dies, it will produce much fruit. Millions of people will be saved and get to heaven, Jesus says, because of my death and burial. He said, I'm going to plant a seed, and the seed is going to be my life. When a seed is buried, it seems to disappear, right? It seems to be lost in the ground. We can no longer see it, but in reality, it's undergoing a process of transformation that leads to new life. In the same way, there's moments in our lives that feel like we've been buried in difficulty, in obscurity, or suffering, but these are often the seasons that God is preparing us for growth and impact. Sometimes we feel like what is a burial is actually a planting. Are you hearing me, church? Here's the principle. Whenever I have a need, I plant a seed. Whenever I have a need, I plant a seed. I don't know what you need. More time? More energy? More money? More support? More relationships? More wisdom? I don't know what you want, but whatever you need more of, you plant a seed. This is the principle of sowing and reaping. When I have a need, I don't gripe about it. I don't complain about it. I don't wish about it. You want to hear something? I don't even need to pray about it necessarily because God's going, all I need is a seed. That's the act of faith. You're asking me for it. I'm waiting on you, son. Plant the seed. You just plant the seed because nothing happens until seed is planted. The third law of sowing and reaping. Number three, whatever I sow is what I reap. Whatever I sow is what I reap. Whatever I put in the ground is what I'm going to reap out. This is the law of reproduction, right? If a farmer goes out and he's got a trailer of beans, red beans, kidney beans, lima beans, whatever, he goes out and he starts planting these beans in a barren field, what fruit does he expect to harvest? Watermelon? Is he going to get candy canes or horses? <laughs> Well, no, 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 he not, he's, get, he's getting beans because he's got his seeds or beans. He's going to reap beans. Whatever you plant is what you're going to get back. He doesn't have to doubt it. He doesn't question it. He knows whatever I sow, I'm going to reap. And listen to me, this applies to every single area of your life and especially to your finances. There's a phrase that's repeated over and over in the book of Genesis. It's the phrase where God says, each produces reproduces after its own kind. Because in God's economy, we reproduce of our own kind. Of the same kind we sow, we produce. Okay, Th this can work either positively for us or it can work negatively in your life. This can work for you or this can work against you. Whatever you sow in life, you're gonna reap. Galatians 6, 7. Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. You, listen, this is a law established on earth. It's how God created us. It's how God established the universe. God will not be made a fool of or mocked. You will reap exactly what you plant. He's saying here, whatever I dish out is what's going to come back. They say what goes around comes around, right? If I'm out planting seeds of kindness to other people, you know what I'm going to get? People are going to be kind to me. If, if I'm out giving grace and mercy and cutting people slack, you know what I'm going to get? I'm going to get grace. I'm going to get mercy. I'm going to get people cutting me slack when I, when I mess up. If I'm forgiving others and letting them off the hook, I'm going to get people letting me off the hook and forgiving me when I mess up. If I'm generous to people, I'm going to get people generous with me because whatever you reap, whatever you sow is what you reap. But the opposite, the negative is true as well. If I go out and I'm just angry all the time, at people, you know what I'm going to get back? I'm going to get back people are angry at me. If I'm critical all the time, people are going to be critical at me. If I'm judging all the time, people are going to be constantly judging me. If I cheat other people, people are going to cheat me. If I gossip about other people, guess what? People are going to gossip about me. Let me just give you a little hint. Anybody who's willing to talk to you about someone else is willing to talk to you as well, talk about you as well. And if you're always talking about somebody else behind their back, you can count on it. People are always talking about you when you're not around. 
This is the law of the universe. Because whatever you sow is what you reap. And if you don't like people talking about you all the time, and that's the narrative that you've spun, you're looking too much at what you're receiving and not what you're giving. This is the kingdom principle that you need, we, we need to understand. Okay, here's the fourth principle. Everything starts as a seed. Nothing happens until the seed is planted. Whatever I sow is what I reap. But number four, I always reap in a different season from when I sow. Isn't this true? There's a time delay from when I make the effort, from when I make the deposit, to when I get the fruit. And we know this. This is pretty obvious. Plants take time to grow. There's no such thing as instant maturity. No farmer goes out, plants a seed, walks away, comes back an hour later, digs it up and goes, are you done? No, no, that's not what he does. Have you grown yet? You've got to just let it be. You've got to let it be covered, let it grow. The Bible tells us there's seasons of life. Ecclesiastes chapter three, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to plant and a different time to harvest, a time to scatter your seed and a time to gather. So between the now and the what's coming next, there's always a delay. And that's so irritating, isn't it? To make a deposit, to make an investment, to plant something, to invest time and energy and money into something that you know is right and just not see the return instantly, but fruit ripens slowly over time. It ripens slowly. This is the principle, like, even in money management, you reap in different seasons than you sow. Not all fruit ripens even at the same time. You, when you start planting and sowing, you start following God's money management principles, you're not going to, you're not going to get your windfall big break tomorrow. Some of you are like, well, I put 10 bucks in the offering plate and I didn't get the job, Pastor. God is not your genie or slot machine, Okay. That's not how it works. We serve, we serve him. He don't serve us. You guys got, we got it twisted. And it's while I'm waiting though, I got to understand it's, it's buried. It's in the ground. I can't go dig that thing up. I can't question it and doubt it. I understand this is a kingdom principle. While I'm waiting, it's a different season. God's working. While I'm waiting, God is working. It's happening. It's happening behind the scenes. In fact, there's all, a lot of times we hear stories and testimonies about people after the delay and after the waiting, and, and, and God came through, but we don't hear a lot of the stories of the middle, of people in the middle just going, and that's where many of us spend most of our time, it's in the middle of it. So we actually recorded a testimony of a family who's in the middle and how they're responding to their middle moment of a seed is buried and they're waiting for the increase. I want you to check it out. Hi, my name is Zach. And my name is Jessica. And we've been coming to a discovery for three years. So we were new to Bakersfield. We had moved from Porterville. First time at discovery, I came around the corner and I saw a guy with the Clippers hat. And you don't meet very many Clipper fans. So I thought he was just wearing it because it matched his outfit. But so I started talking to him and he knew his stuff and then he showed me he had a clipper tattoo right here, and that's what it took. <laughs> and now Discovery is our home. So we went to Tracks, and it was great because Pastor Jason was like, this is who I am, this is the church. Hearing the vision of Discovery and just talking about it, we were like, let's make Discovery our home. And just God started repairing like what we lost through community, and just we have the best community ever. We just feel like super blessed. And we were at a small group and this wonderful couple like taught on tithing. And I kind of, kind of got me thinking like the seed was planted. Like I know with the company, they sell things or they offer a service and they get money. And that's how they pay their bills, you know? And I was sitting in church, like looking at the lights and looking at the things they give and thinking they don't sell services. Like how do they pay these things? Oh, the church. That's where the tithe comes in. And I had been consuming, you know, being a consumer and taking in and being fed a good word, giving things, you know, building community. And I just felt like when you first go to a church, you're like coming and you're taking off the shelf, right? And that's okay. But then there comes a certain point where you start to put on the shelf for other people. And God had just been so good to us, and I was just receiving so much that it was like, yes, God, I surrender everything to you. Like, you can have every part of us. 
So I remember early on in our marriage, we hadn't always been good stewards of our money. Uh, we had like credit card debt and different things. And I remember asking Zach like, hey, like things are tight. Like, should we skip tithe this month? And he said, you don't rob God of what is his. I had been working for a wonderful company for 18 years and, you know, seen a lot of increase and promotion um, and God's faithfulness in the job. And in May, my remote job was no longer remote, um, which means I would have had to move across the country in a tight time frame or found another position with the company or just, you know, um, essentially been laid off. And we talked about it and like, we didn't want to move. Discovery was at the top of our minds, you know, the freedom journey we're on and how God had been moving through discovery in our lives. Like it just was very premature. It was like, I don't want to rip out these roots just yet. Um, so it was really unsettling to us and we prayed about it and we, crunch the numbers, you know, like, is it possible not to go? Because we, we chose freedom. Like, Discovery is such a wonderful church where not only do they want to deliver a great message and just do all these cool things, but they want to set us free. Like, they want us to be changed. They don't want us to come back the way we came and to break, like, generational curses and idolatry. And I have to be honest, it wrecked me. I felt like it was more of a test for me because I wasn't trusting God. And uh, I don't know why not, probably because I'm human. And that was my first first reaction. I think God was asking me, why are you not trusting me? I've never let you down, not once. Sorry, God. I forgot, but my wife reminded me really quick. And God's saying, slow down, slow down. Just remember me, I got you. And uh, he was right because uh, I got the joy now. I don't know what's gonna happen, I have no clue, um, but I'm excited to see all of you guys are gonna see what happens along with us. No, I think God has great plans for us. Um, he wants to bless us, you know? He says, test me. In Malachi 3.10, it's like God, your word says that you're gonna provide everything we need, um, that you're gonna give us immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. So, okay, we're gonna stay. We're going to trust you. And that's the surrender, you know, he's gonna come through. I would say to anybody that, you know, is hesitant to start giving, you're missing out. You're missing out on the fullness of God. And it's not like, I'm not, God's not like, I'm not gonna be good to you because you're not, but like, it like cranks it up. Like he has all of you because like, that's usually the last place where we are obedient is in our finances. It's just because of the world we live in and we hang on to it like this, right? And like God can't give you your blessings, you know, and the fullness and the freedom until you let go um, and you're open-handed like, okay, God, I release this area to you. I surrender. I trust you. I don't understand, you know, but I'm going to give you this area. And if you're, you're wrestling with it, then the Holy Spirit's already working in your heart and just say, God, I, I don't get it, but I'm going to trust you in it. Amen. I love how over the years that, that people have chosen to not take promotions or leave the city because they found such community and hope in life here at Discovery. But I don't know what you're in the middle of right now, but I do want you to know you're not alone. You just reap a harvest in a different season from which you sow. And you can guarantee it, just like the faith of Zach and, and Jessica, they, they have an assurance of faith that I know God's going to come through. And if you're in the middle of something that you've sown and you've been working at it and it's buried and you can't see it, trust that God is working. Even when you can't see it, God is working. Amen? Okay, the fifth principle, you guys, and I'm going to go quick. Number five, I always reap more 
then I sow. Now, this is, this is a, a, the law of, 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 of harvest, of sowing and reaping. The, this is always true for good or bad, positively or negatively. In your life, you're, you will reap more than you sow. This is the principle of multiplication. If you take a kernel of corn and you put that one kernel in the ground, you don't get one kernel back, do you? No, you get a whole stock, and on that stock has a whole bunch of girls and a whole bunch of corn. You got hundreds of from the potential of one seed. It's the exponential power of one seed that God has established in the universe. You always get more out than you put in. It's a law. It's the parable of the soils. Jesus points out in Mark chapter 4, verse 8. He says, some seed fell on the good soil, and it came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, and even a hundred times. He's saying they're, not all plants and not all seed bear the same fruit. Some come back 30 fold increase. Some seeds you're planting has a 60 fold, some a hundred fold, but it's true in every area of your life. If you think that you can go out and do one gossip and get one gossip back, you are fooling yourself. Cause now you're in the chain, bro. You're in the gossip chain now. You do one gossip, I promise you, you're reaping a harvest back. Amen? You always reap more than you sow. Here's the next principle, number six. I can increase my harvest by planting more seed. This is the law of proportion, that we always reap in proportion to what we sow. If I sow a bunch of seed, I'm going to get a bunch of crop. If I sow a little seed, I'm going to get a little crop. If I sow no seed, I'm going to get no crop. This is true in giving and tithing. It's true, though, in your energy expenditure. It's true of your talent. It's true of your intelligence. It's true in every single area of your life. I can increase my harvest by planting more seed. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says like this. Remember, whoever sows sparingly reaps sparingly. This is the principle all throughout the Bible, you guys. He says, whoever sows generously, reaps generously. Each one should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, this particular passage is talking about money as a seed, but it's more than just money. Here it's talking about money, but he's basically saying, you can't outgive God. You give the seed, and he multiplies harvest back to you. I think I've told you this before, but the Greek word for cheerful here is hilarious. In the Greek, it's where we get the word hilarious from. Why? Because God loves your heart attitude. That's what he loves. God doesn't need your money. He wants what it represents. A lot of people are like, well, God's just, oh, you're just after, that church is after my money. God just wants my money. You know what? You're right. He does. God, God, but he's, he's not after it. He's after what's tied to it. Because wherever your treasure is, Jesus said, your heart will be also. And he knows where your heart is because he's seen you reach down at that thing before, down at your wallet. And when you do, you're like, oh, you got, it's like, it's like there's a string attack. Ah, oh, never mind. I'm not going to do it. It hurts too much. He sees. <laughs> Proverbs 11. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. This is the principle. Because it's giving. It's not about what we're receiving. It's about what we're giving. And if I'm generous, I'm just, I'm, I'm increasing my harvest in my field. It's growing. It's growing. It's exponential. The world of the generous keeps getting larger and larger. My field keeps growing. Whatever that field is, you apply it to your relationships, to your love, to your peace, to your intellect, everything. Whatever I'm giving, it's just getting larger. It's getting larger. But the world of the stingy <laughs> gets smaller and smaller. Okay, one last principle. The seventh law of harvest is I must be patient and not give up. This is the laws of harvest, kingdom principles. To reap the harvest that God wants me to have, I have to be patient. I can't give up in the middle of it. Why? Because remember, there's always a delay between the sowing and the reaping. You plant in one season and you harvest in another. This principle we're talking about today, it's a kingdom principle. It's, it's one of the principles that the kingdom of God operates on that is essential to you living the blessed life. Galatians 6, 9 says, we must not become, I read this to you last week, weary, tired of doing good. We will reap a harvest at the right time. 
In the meantime, don't give up. Don't give up doing good. Don't give up serving and giving and loving and forgiving and and your kindness and your grace and your mercy. Don't give up. Don't stop. Because in the right time, we're going to reap a harvest if we don't give up. As your pastor who loves you, let me just say this to you heart to heart. You got to forget about last year's crop failure. There's nothing you could do about it. About last year's crop failure. You, 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 you've, listen, you've wasted years of your life, and so have I. You've wasted words, and so have I. You've wasted money, so have I. You've wasted time, so have I. You've wasted energy. You, you, you have wasted relationships, I do too. You've wasted goodwill on people who are manipulative and backstabbed you. Get it, yeah, so have I. What you got to do is you got to start focusing on your long-term harvest in life and not your short-term pleasure. The long-term harvest. Some of you, your finances are in such a mess right now, you're probably, it's probably brought you to tears. Let me give you a verse and give you a promise, Psalm 126. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed. Okay, God, this is hard. It's hard to trust again, forgive again, love again. It's hard to give. It's hard to, okay, God. <sighs> and, and I'm even crying as I'm doing it, but I'm, this is an act of faith that I know is going to give you glory. Weep as they go to plant their seed, but they'll sing as they return with the harvest. So let me ask you a question. What are you grieving today? What have you loss what lack are you grieving maybe you lost your job maybe you've lost a loved one maybe you've lost your savings maybe it was a loss of your dream maybe it was a loss of your marriage or a loss of your health you know mourning is okay mourning is okay moaning is not there's a big difference mourning is okay grief is a legitimate response to loss grief is good jesus says blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. If you let your mourning and your grief turn you to God, it's a good thing. Moaning is not. What's moaning? It's when you're griping and you're whining and you're complaining to God all the time. Lord, I don't have any work and God, I don't have no money and I don't have and I don't have. And God's saying, plant some seeds then. Are you just going to complain about it? What are you waiting on? You're waiting on me. You're praying. What do you want? I gave you the seed already. Plant it. And then I'll do something. Whatever you need more of, you got to give away. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.